So again, thank you for the kind introduction. And I, I want to, uh, to talk about also the, the paper we published this year in engineering. This was a, a big work of one of my PhD students, which is now a postdoc at Glaxera. Uh, she, she's, uh, this is uh, Samantha Jahic. And uh, she was responsible also for all the, let's say, collaborations with with medical universities. So she during his her PhD and and also now she is responsible for our medical applications, glycom medical applications, which is the seminar today about. Therefore, I will present mainly her work. Um, so um, <clears throat> where do we want to go? We want to go into into structural glycomics so we want the, not only want to do want to know the uh, let me maybe add a pointer not only want to to have the the glycan composition via glycom glycan masses so that we can say how many hexoses and how many uh hexnax and how many deoxyhexoses or so we have um we want to know more if possible um it's not ah, okay. So we want to have at least uh, a structure. So at least the, the, the topology, but often depending if you only use one method in particular, if you use mass spectrometry, this is a more or less, in my eyes, a more or less educated guess. So this is only with some, a lot of effort uh, in the data analysis and, and some tricks in the measurement, you can find out more than uh, the glycan composition, you can find out something about um, the topology. Yeah? And with some background information, you can then make uh, an educated guess. Um, so if you know, is it, is it from a dog? Is it human? Is it plant? Is it a bird uh, protein and glycosylation? So, but there are always possibilities for alternative isobaric structures. So there is always, uh, there stays an uncertainty. And only um, if if you spend more effort or if you combine different methods, um, you can get really the actual fine structure um, of of the molecule of interest. So you get safe information about connectivity and configuration. So um, you get this increased evidence uh, if you use multi-method approaches. And multi can already be in two. Yeah? So if you use not only one method but two methods. And uh, as uh, Professor Wang already uh, nicely promoted, uh, we have developed uh, a method based on multiplex capillary gel electrophoresis with laser induced fluorescence detection. And in, in short, XCG lift. And this enables us to do high performance glycoanalysis. So we can, we can either conduct glycoanalysis in high throughput, yeah? so several thousand samples per day with one instrument. Um, or we can do it in in-depth mode. This is then, of course, not any more several thousand samples, but still quite a number of samples, and we can do in-depth in a decent time frame. And uh, how does this come from? So this is, we have instruments from four to 96 capillaries in parallel. This gives us the high throughput. Um, um, the patented technology we developed gives us highest reproducibility and robustness. So we have very low uh, standard deviations. This means we can use databases for, for matching structures with normalized migration times. We have separation by charge and mass, but also by shape. So this is a very high separation power. And thus, we can easily distinguish isobaric structures just by the difference of one linkage. And we have laser-induced fluorescence detection, which gives us very high sensitivity. And as already told, I'm not only heading a uh, group for bioprocess analytics at the Max Planck, I'm also founder and CEO of the Glucera GmbH. Therefore, uh, I might be biased <clears throat> about the CG lift, but I will show you also that helix and mass spectrometry is very important for glycan analysis, not only CG lift. Um, so regarding the high throughput, what we can do, this, were, this was uh, blood plasma, total end glycome of blood plasma samples. And um, here is just to show you the, the high throughput possibilities. So we were able to do a separation of almost 5,000 samples in only two days. 
and with the with this developed method and software, we could do the data processing and the structural assignment automatically. So these are samples we can easily handle with XCGLIF. Um, if if we have unknown <coughs> structures which are maybe not in the database and cannot be assigned, or if the sample is too complex, this is our examples. I will come later on. We can do a so-called extended glyco profiling, where we do exoglycidase sequencing uh, to, for in-depth structural elucidation. So um, this can be done in parallel in a decent time and enables us to get the full structural elucidation of new or unknown glycan peaks or also from multi-structure peaks and also quantitative data out of that, that this peak is composed by this percentage of this glycan and this percentage of the other glycan. Um, as I said, for blood plasma and glycome or for, for IgG, this is not necessary, but you still can use it. Um, this is published uh, in a book chapter from, um, from Samantha um, at the Springer. You can see this below, where we really sequence down all the glycans of IgG and show some other stuff. Um, but it gets more challenging if we not only do uh, simple uh, glycoproteins, purified glycoproteins like IgG or, or, or blood plasma. So if we do total cell lysates or tissues. So, and uh, these are already the applications uh, <clears throat> with, with our medical collaboration partners. So here we investigated um, the, the, uh, how the glycosylation affects the infectivity of SIV, HIV viruses. And what we found is that depending on the glycosylation, these viruses have either a high mucosal transmission so they spread fastly, or if they have another glycosylation, they are highly effective, infective. So they, and of course, worst case scenario, if you combine both. Um, we also investigated the effect of uh, congenital disorders of glycosylation on the glycosylation itself, published uh, in MCP. And here we found in the first few, we, we sequenced down all the stuff. This was very complex, total cell lysates. Uh, we sequenced down the glycans to really be able to safely annotate the structures. But we found that there is the distribution of the different glycan species is unaffected by, by this kind of CDG. But having a clo closer look and adding a, a internal absolute quantification standard here at a position where no other glycan shows up, we could show that there is a hypoglycosylation. So not all uh, glycosylation sites are occupied with the ratio they should be occupied. And this affects, of course, the health of the patient. Um, another uh, investigation we did was on cardiomyocytes, um, uh, which were derived from, uh, induced from pluripotent stem cells. And here we could show that <clears throat> during the development from, from, from stem cells to cardio cells, um, the glycosylation pattern changed. So um, the, the, the red marked um, structures, which were high mannose and antenna focusylation and beta 1, 3 galactosylation, they decreased over the time while the bisecting, the alpha 2, 3 silylation and the higher uh, the antenna number increased over the time. And again, we had to dig to, to find all the structures out. We had to sequence the stuff down because these uh, glycosylation patterns of tissue are very complex or of cells. So there are several hundred glycans in. Um, and what we found then finally were new stem cell glycobiomarkers. So these three structures are typical um, for uh, the um, development from uh, stem cells to cardio cells. Um, another investigation was on mouse. So here we investigated the impact of silic acids during embryonic development and <clears throat> found that in early stage, at least, silylation is indispensable. Uh, is dispensable. Uh, later, of course, it gets very important to have a healthy development of the embryo, but in the early stage, it's not that important. And 
with these examples, which we got cell lysates and tissues, which we got from, from, from clinics, um, we saw that, let's say, the data analysis of these very complex glycosylation patterns is very time consuming and tedious. And therefore we were uh, thinking about uh, the possibility to fractionate uh, the glycomes, the complex glycomes, and to measure it in, in less complex uh, compositions and also with different um, methods. And therefore, um, we started uh, research on a removable dice, uh, which we think is the missing link for in-depth glycan analysis via multi-method approaches. Mm -hmm. And this is the paper published in engineering this year. So <clears throat> Samantha um, developed a method um, uh, for removable and glycan labels. So we can, we can really take very complex samples, do the N-glycan release, do the labeling via a removable linker. Uh, the example here is, for example, FMOC can be used, and we do the glycan purification, helic, so a semi-preparative uh, helic uh, fractionation, getting simpler uh, mixtures, and then can remove the linker, <coughs> do either direct MS measurement or some um, etyl esterification, the method from Manfred, for example, works nicely. Um, do some N-glycan labeling, either, for example, 2AB or 2AA, um, or uh, for helic, or the APTS labeling for, for our method, the multiplex capillary gel electrophoresis. And then we can do the analysis, for example, with three different methods, like with helic, with MALDI, and with XCG lib, and uh, getting easier access to structural data. And more safety. Um, <clears throat> so employing this fractionation and orthogonal methods um, is advantages because each method has, has its advantages and disadvantages. So not a single method is able to really support all required information. For example, here, in, when we measure it with CG lib, so this is a very uh, crowded uh, finger, like a fingerprint. And for example, if we then try to sequence down with an alpha galactosidase, a lot of peaks change their position, disappear, new peaks appear. So it's really hard to assign what happened with which structure or with which peak during the fractionation, <coughs> uh, during the, the uh, sequencing. And therefore we first fractionate uh, these complex samples into, for example, 15 fractions and can then uh, combine um, the measurement of the different structures with one or two or even three uh, methods. And um, of course, this method was not ready from the very first day. So we had to, to do a lot of work on the method optimization, especially regarding release, labeling, and also stability. So we tested quite a lot, finally found um, a good working mode and uh, uh, having done all the, this optimization on release, labeling, sample purification, and so on, and, and again, release of the removable dye. Um, in this paper, we also showed some applications of the method. So albo, ovalbumin, lactoferrin, horse serum, and bovine transferrin. And I will show only two examples today because of sake of time. <coughs> First one is uh, the ovalbumin. So here, uh, when we started, um, Without fractionation, there were compositions uh, which allowed of one peak only, which allowed even 20 different structures. So the database look up, uh, not, uh, cut this down to six possibilities and with uh, some uh, exoglycidase digest of these sim very simplified uh, mixtures, fractions, we could exclude quite some structures. Um, still six uh, were possible. Um, and then we picked some of them, further digested them down, in this case with galactosidase, and could exclude uh, four more structures. So could confirm one structure, the same with the, uh, with the other pig. We, in this case, we added a manositase, could exclude um, some structures, and finally ended up that these two pigs uh, have uh, these two structures. So the one is <coughs> a hybrid uh, with an asymmetric uh, split in the uh, three antenna, 
and the other one is also a hybrid, but a bisecting hybrid, and not the third antenna. Okay. Um, and this, of course, is much easier to find out if you have a sample like this and not this messy sample I showed before. So you can easily assign what happens during the sequencing. And uh, for example, if you don't do that here, it's hard to see what happens. So this is the tiny fraction beyond this peak and this moves to this peak in, by the digestion. So this is hard to find, especially a lot of other structures also move. Um, second application, um, I can show uh, is uh, transferrin, uh, mildly n glycans. Uh, so, this is the mildly measurement um, with Manfred's uh, technology of the etude certification. We can at least say that there is alpha 23 and alpha 26 silylation in, um, but we cannot really assign it uh, to the uh, antennas. And therefore, we did additional XCG lift, different silylases. Beta galactosidase one three and beta galactosidase one four measurements, and then we could assign the silic acids to the to the structures, and we could show that we have even uh, uh, glucnac silylation alpha two six, and that we have both structures in. So one is in the three antenna, and the other one has this. Uh, is mirrored is uh, has the um, two silic acids at the uh, three antenna and here again it's easier to assign if the mixture is not too complex this brings me already to my last slide um, where I want to acknowledge especially uh, the work, uh, Samantha Jahic and her hard work, um, but also René Hennig, who did a lot on the method development, Valerian Grote, who helped a lot and did some uh, the measurements on the MALDI, and of course, our boss at the Max Planck Institute, uh, Professor Udo Eichel. And uh, the collaboration with the Hanover Medical School was quite fruitful, therefore, I, of course, I want to mention them, and uh, also the Glyxera, which supported all the stuff with special software development and other things. Thank you very much. Gongcheng, Chuang Zhao Renlei, Mei Hao Wei Lai. <laughs>